Hey everybody, Michael Swaim here, and I'm doing it. I'm calling you to action. I am sincerely asking that if you're able, you'll check us out over at patreon.com slash smallbeans, where if you upgrade to being a $5 a month or more patron, you get access to twice as many pods like Star Trek The Next Futurama, Spielboys, Director Peace Theater, and One-Upsmanship, and even more great stuff. So hey, come on in. The water's beans. Patreon.com slash smallbeans. Welcome to episode 100 of Frame Rate, the show where we rate frames. I was just looking at the playlist. We're in the mid-hundreds, man. Pretty good. That's pretty, pretty good, good for one show. Yeah. Uh-huh. One little bean. That's Abe Epperson. I'm Michael Swaim, his doppelganger. Hi. We have the same scars. <laughs> you know, I've never seen us both in the same room. No, because whenever I see you in a room, it's from some guy's point of view, and I'm not in the room. So, I, it, so from my view, me? I can't see us. Are right. You, I, I don't know. And that's the kind of <laughs> complex, sophisticated analysis you've come to expect from just the intro part of frame rate. Then we actually get good once we're warmed up. And as always, we're joined by a fabulous guest to help us do that. And by that, I mean cover enemy. Let's invite our guest into the room now virtually, Mr. Jason Pargin. How's it going? Hey, is it K? Hey. I noticed K in, in one of your handles. Yeah, the middle initial is K. Yeah, because I think I found on at least one of the 700 platforms I had to join, Jason Pargin already been taken, so I had to put the middle initial in there. And then I thought, well, that kind of sounds like an author an author thing. You've got the extra initial. It does. Uh, so yeah. now I just... Mm-hmm. Or a bullwinkle thing, either <laughs> or. Yeah. You should just go by K. Ooh. Ooh, that would be man. cool. Agent people, K. people would. We're onto a movie here. Would hate me if I did that. Wouldn't that be obnoxious? <laughs> yeah. I start going by a letter. Nah. Oh, so cool. Well, we watched. If I could plug a thing to transition into Jason's plugs, we watched Fritz Lang's M last night, which is a movie that's just a letter. Quite good. You can join us Monday nights at six p.m. PT on the Small Beans Discord server to watch a movie with Abe and I, and sometimes Adam. Um, and Jason, before we like dig into enemy, uh, I, you got something to plug 21 times you were saying before we started rolling. <laughs> yeah. That's the, the number of, of which this is just the number one. of podcast appearances I've lined up to promote the, uh, the new book. Zoe is too drunk for this dystopia, which by the time you're hearing this, it is probably out comes out on October 31st. Uh, I know this comes out in waves depending on your level of membership. So some of you, it's either about to come out or is already out. This the third book in the Zoe Ash series, um, but they're episodic. You can read this one first if you want to, which would be a weird choice because it's by far the most expensive. The first two you could probably get for free from any uh, library or dumpster. I don't know. Bearded man with a trench coat downtown by the wharf. Yeah. yeah. Uh, highly recommended reading. Yes. Uh, I'm a sci-fi boy more than a horror boy. So it's my preferred of Jason's series, but the uh, they're both great. The John Dies at the End series being the other one. Uh, so go pre-order. It's always too drunk for this dystopia. Or buy it now if you're listening to this on the free feed. Okay, let's talk enemy. Um, because ironically, or nope, that's not the right usage. Fittingly, uh, Abe and I also recently watched Enemy on the stream. I did watch it again to take notes for this, but uh, we love this movie. And we love talking about it because we love movies that open themselves up very easily to being talked about. Um, So, Jason, if you would like kick off what is sure to be a pretentious navel gazing episode, Mm. why did you pick Enemy from the long list of movies we could have watched? Well, I wanted something that was kind of spooky because, again, for me, Halloween extends from September 1st until Thanksgiving. Uh, so we're still, sure. I don't even care if you're listening to this on November 15th, we're still in the heart of the spooky season. The The Simpsons Halloween episode is probably not aired yet. We're still right there in that in that area. And this film is, plays like a horror film. I think horror fans are not 
big on it because it's not doesn't have a lot of the standard beats for a horror film. It is a very slow burn if you see it as such. Has what some consider the all-time greatest jump scare in the history of cinema in that the entire <laughs> runtime it's of the good. film builds to a single jump scare that only comes out of nowhere the first time you see it. You watch it on repeat. You you understand a lot of the symbolism and why it is building to that. Um, but it also is a movie that gives you a lot to discuss and in ways that some fans detest. <laughs> some people <laughs> truly hate movies like this. Right. That are like essay movies designed to spawn essays. Um, I, yeah, I have a whole thesis about this, which is great because that's what we'll do. And that's what I've always wanted to dispense about enemy. And then I can be done with it. Um, but I want to throw it to Abe because I know he's capable of couching this in terms of like the filmmaker we haven't even mentioned who made this movie, Abe, and why are they notable and where did it come in their career? If I could uh, put you on the spot with that shit. Yeah, no problem. Uh, it's uh, Denny Villeneuve. Which he's the Dune Man. He's the Dune Man right now. He's making Dunes. Dune Man. But uh, this was uh 2013. Uh, it's preempted uh Arrival. This pre preempted um, what's the other one that I like? Uh, Prisoners. Um, yeah, he's got a lot of uh, he's got a lot of cred now. I think not only are his images beautiful, he works with high tier actors, top tier actors. And um, they always bring a, a great performance because he likes to kind of dive into uh, very immensely flawed characters that seem like they're just like average Joes at first. Um, he, he loves that shit. Um, but yeah, he's he's one of my faves because uh, yeah. I like his subtlety. We've talked about him a lot. Uh, we talked about him on Escape from Multicurse. He did Blade Runner 2049. Blade Runner 2049. Oof. Be- yeah. Just eye candy, my God. Um, and in this house, yeah, I mentioned it, but we really go to bat for Prisoners, which is not eye candy or epic or sweeping in the way that Villeneuve has been historically, um, is just fucking rips. It's just a great ass movie. Jason, you yeah. like that Prisoners? It's not my favorite, <gasps> but it's it's fine. It, great. It, it's, well, good, because we're not discussing it. It had a weird thing where it seemed like there were an awful lot of serial killers living in that one area like they kept running into people that could be serial killers or or also were but they weren't the one they were looking for i don't know it was a it was it was a weird movie but i appreciate what people well if you follow the enemy model any number of them could be doppelgangers or facets of their own psyche Um, so i want to just i feel like the way to go about it and anyone feel free to pull the other way if this is not right is be like okay so jason mentioned it opens itself up to like theses and essays. Anyone want to share one? What's the, what's your major? Like, uh, I don't know. I don't want to do the synopsis. I feel like this is one people should watch and we can of course reference like stuff that happens, but I don't feel the need to synopsize it. Could we just like start under the hood? Is that yeah, weird? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, go watch it, but if you haven't watched and you're just here for the conversation, you don't care. It's just about a, a, a dude having an affair um see that, that, that's where i disagree ah it's already begun uh, yeah <laughs> baby let's go well okay so Hall has said it's about a man who's married his wife is pregnant and he's having an affair and he's trying to reconcile those things so it's a like about a guy who meets his doppelganger one is married and one has a girlfriend and there's a sex club involved I still don't read it that way. And when I say I don't, I mean that's a choice. I could read it that way, and I do see how it is that. And even Villeneuve also mainly stumps for that and talks about how it's mainly about fascism and a teacher coming to terms with how he's a fascist to women even though he decries fascism. And I'm like, I see how those pieces are there. But the thing about... Uh, just toxic masculinity incel culture is way riper to me. So I choose to see that layer. That layer seems more <laughs> interesting to me. Uh, <laughs> it works yeah, I mean, incel wise as well. And I love all that shit. It reminds me of in school when I, I learned uh, the first time this blew my mind was Lord of the Flies when they were like, Simon can be Jesus. And I forget, but like, you know, Piggy's Judas or whatever. <laughs> right, right, and right. then, but then they're also, it's also the id, the ego and the super ego. And I'm like, Oh word, you can do that. <laughs> you can like double up. Yeah. Or, and this movie's very much in that vein. 
Uh, I got to ask the guests, Jason, thoughts, enemy thoughts, deeper thoughts. Well, just stepping back, for, for non-viewers of the film, I think the discussion Please. is going to be incredibly confusing because the actual thing that happens in the movie— I don't care, but if you do, go for it. <laughs> the actual thing that happens in the movie is Jake Gyllenhaal plays two different people who are identical down to their facial hair. He has, They have the same scar. And the central plot of the movie on a surface level is him trying to solve this mystery because basically he runs into his doppelganger. He sees him as an extra in a movie that was filmed in where they live. I guess it's just Toronto. And so he tries to track the guy yeah. down. And then as the movie goes on, the central mystery for you as a viewer is it's like, well, are they twins? Are they brothers? What's happened? Is is he losing his mind? Is it a fight club thing? And because the more they find out about each other, I guess kind of mysterious. They're, one of them will refer to their mother, but it seems clear at some point that they're both talking about the same woman when they refer to their mother. And so mm-hmm. when did she? She doesn't know. And then they reveal they have the same scar. Okay, so it's not even a twin thing because twins don't have the same scar. And the same. So it escalates. And the same in that photo way. of yeah. themselves at home. One of them has been ripped to not. Right. So anyway, the the central thrust as you're watching it is trying to solve this mystery, and then at the end it kind of doesn't, it, it never resolves itself. There's never the revelation moment of Fight Club where it's like, oh, okay, I have a mental right. illness and here's how I have to fight it. But because it's important to note, the first thing the doppelgangers basically land on is, I bet I could fuck this guy's wife. I bet I could fuck this guy's girlfriend. And to me, that's part of the whole toxic masculinity thing. That's why they get derailed immediately. Right, because the the central mystery of, of all this stuff, what you eventually figure out upon reviewing is that's not what's important. What's important is that it, it is symbolizing the two halves of a person, but then the interesting stuff is in how that manifests and how they treat women and the relationships and all that. That's what I think Denis Villeneuve finds interesting. I, I think the, the the thing that the plot is allegedly about this guy trying to solve the mystery of why does this guy look just like me is actually not what you get out of the film. Yeah, it doesn't get you anywhere. You're not going to have a satisfying watch, which is why people find it a a little bit dense and like a lot of people have described this as David Lynchian, you know, and it always, mm, yeah. I kind of agree with that. Uh, I agree with the David feel. Lynch puts me in the feeling of like behind the curve, you know, it, it makes me feel like I'm like, Oh, put me in coach. You know, like I, I elect me to be with your story. Don't like talk above me and then let me figure it out yeah. later. Uh, and this movie does have a little of that. <clears throat> and I feel that that's a valid criticism. Yeah, true. But I do think it's so and it's not even a criticism because I think Lynch pushes slightly more towards true abstraction. And that means the pieces are there at like a puzzle for you to put together as you please and see different shapes in like you would look at clouds. And that's rewarding in its own right. I would say enemy does have the thing I like the best, which is right. it mathematically holds up to the unpacking. You go like, right. for example, oh, if if you like my read about incel, one of the guys is named Adam. Their scar is where the rib would be removed in the biblical story. And his girlfriend is Mary, who is basically... Well, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother, that's the template of the Madonna whore complex, which incel guys fall prey to, right? So the math all checks out, and Lynch doesn't really do that. And you forget in the Bible, Anthony, who's just like the fuck boy, <laughs> who's the like fuck near boy the there tree, also. who's just like, yeah. wanna, wanna go back. Well, that's what I'm saying is there's many pieces there, and they don't all support each other. There's multiple reads, and I think intentionally so. Well, I think that's what's actually fascinating about the fact that both Jake Gyllenhaal and the director in interviews, when people ask about this very ambiguous plot, they're like, oh, no, it's just it's just one guy and he's having an affair and Tim having to reconcile the reckless affair having side of his personality with the responsibility because one of the women, his wife is pregnant. So it's like him fighting against this immature and misogynist part of himself. The fact that they are so ready to come out and say – because again, the film kind of presents it as a mystery: are they twins? Are they clones? Are they that they were both so ready to say, "Oh no, it's 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 one guy. This is the story of one guy," and you're seeing his perspective and and him fighting against this this aspect of himself. I think that proves how little, how how uninteresting they find that part of the story. Like trying to figure out is it two guys mm. or not. The interesting stuff is what. Or it's like they want to give you the key so you can get in. So every, right. everything you're yeah. saying about like his attitude toward women and how toxic it is, and then the the sex show with the spiders and all that. That's all there. That that's all. It's all subtext and it's it's text. Like that's the, both of them treat these women like trash. 
Right. Well, you just made me unlock another one, which is that it, it, in the reconciling way, it's just one guy version. Anthony and Mary, the girlfriend who in this equation would be a mistress, uh, their ending is they get in a pretty toxic man versus woman argument in the car and have a fatal crash. So I guess that's him deciding to reinvest in his that wife, That is right? absolutely right. Yes. And, <laughs> but then when he gets the sex club thing and decides, maybe I will go to that strip club he one more time, through. it's mm-hmm. like, what are we doing, man? Yeah, exactly. Because, all right, all right, no, no, dude, I'm not uh, saying that in a bad way. I'm saying it's the tragedy. That's the tragedy, right? That's the tragedy. Yeah. You know, the first lines of the film from uh, from Professor Jake are control. It's all about control. And then he follows it up with like, it's a pattern that repeats itself in history. And he keeps talking about totalitarianism and regimes uh, until he has this Marx quote uh, or this like uh, combined quote that basically is this concept that um, uh, one author said that all great uh, world events occur twice. And then Karl Marx threw on top of it the first time it's a tragedy, the second time it's a joke. Mm -hmm. Villeneuve has actually said this in an interview up front. He says it's like. It's a man who leaves his mistress to return to his pregnant wife, and we see the story from his subconscious point of view. That's what the movie is. Um, so he kills this narcissistic, selfish self, uh, and he, but then he jumps back to adultery at the first chance he gets, and it's almost laughable. Um, yeah, there's. Yeah. A, I, I think that that's. Well, the very first right line on. of the movie is "Chaos is your order, yet undeciphered," which almost sounds comforting because it makes you think oh we go in the direction of entropy becoming order you know that's good safety human progress um but it's also another way of saying like everything is chaos underneath orders made of chaos <laughs> so right. it is do du- that statement is duality itself right uh as order gets fastened into chaos so order is just chaos with a coat of paint on top of it and like the quote itself a comforting story you know, <laughs> yeah, I, totally. Yeah. Well, we should jump in here. I love this movie. We should jump in here. That quote <laughs> is from the book this film is based on. It's based on. Mm-hmm. Oh, I didn't even know that. Yeah, it's it's Peace. a 2002 novel that was from Portugal called The Double. I thought years ago that this film was based on the Dostoevsky novel. I can't pronounce his name. The also called the double that has nothing to do with spiders or people having sex with each other. Uh, I was wrong. It's a much less famous novel also called the double that was an award-winning novel. Mm -hmm. And it's reading the plot summary. I have not read the book. It's got all of the elements except for the spider symbolism. It doesn't have any of that. That was added for the film, Um, but it has, but the thoughtfulness was sort of baked in. And in the book at the ending, it ends not with the spider jump scare. It ends with once he has gotten rid of his double, the double dies in a car accident. He gets a call from a voice that sounds just like his own starting the cycle again, saying, oh, my gosh. And now he's oh my gosh, you, Anthony. You sound so just it's like more me. about addiction and psychosis. It, well, yeah. That's it's, cool. about the, it's about him not truly escaping that cycle. It's about him never truly reckoning. I think it's trying to imply that he's actually been through this many times where he has... If you know anybody who has these destructive impulses, they run in cycles and you will talk to them and they, you know, it's like, no, I've broken up with her. Everything is great. I will never get into a toxic relationship like that again. I've got a new job. Everything's wonderful. And then six months later, you see it fall apart in exactly the way the previous one did. And most people who have some sort of thing that they struggle with, it moves in cycles. And if they beat it, it's not over one cycle. It's over a bunch of them. So I think here they tweaked it a little bit to make it more visual. And I think it adds, the spider stuff adds another layer of meaning that is distinct to this filmmaker. (laughs) And it's, I think it's true and primarily true of anything. Anytime anyone sort of out of shame develops the ability to lead a double life, right? Like obviously intentional, but every lie splits us from others. Not that it's bad. Sometimes Mm -hmm. we call that privacy and we like it. But um, I did a classic one, alcoholism, and I wasn't – there are people who are like loud and proud alcoholic, right? Like, yeah, I drink a lot publicly in front of everyone. I drank secretly, so I did develop the ability that Gyllenhaal has in this, and I think a lot of addicts do of anything, sex or whatever, even a point of view. 
to keep it secret. And it absolutely is a cycle of getting caught, thinking it won't happen again, building the secret up a little more, a little more, getting caught, or even just catching yourself, breaking it down, building it up. And then one day you find five years have gone by and the cycle didn't repeat, but it's but it was, it was like cycle, 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 cycle. And then it's finally done. Finally. Like it takes, uh, it's how we do, man. And it's, it's so interesting that I think the core mechanic that most of us now understand to be the very basics of human psychology is that trauma shapes what we think is normal when we're a kid and we do it over and over and over and over and over like to everything else for the rest of our lives. Right. Unless we consciously practice not doing that. And I guess that's how I interpret the spider stuff, because the film has little there's spider symbolism all through it. He has a dream sequence where he sees like a nude woman with the head of a tarantula. And of course, he goes to that sex show where it's like a woman as sort of of a fetish thing. She's going to crush a spider under her high heels. But there's also stuff like there's constant shots of of the overhead trolley wires that crisscross in the sky like a spider web. The web and the crash. Yeah, that's that's right. uh, Dashboard or the windshield oh yeah and of course the huge spider uh, that <laughs> and just across the shot the, of a spider uh, i believe it, it might be ottawa it's no Vancouver, it might be toronto somewhere, but yeah, i was lo- Canada. but i read about it and that it, it looks exactly like a famous like a uh, art installation in that city it's as if it um, came to life right and that's and it's called the mother spider is the name of the art installation um and I don't know. I don't know if we're about to go to, but I do want to talk about mothers. Well, oh, oh, uh, we'll do. Yeah, we should do mothers. I just wanted to ask a question while we're still on fascism, though, because the web and spider stuff, a lot of critics take to be something, something fascism taking over the slow creep, getting right. trapped. Um, and there, I'll read something from Forrest Wickman of Slate, who said enemy is a parable about what it's like to live under a totalitarian state without knowing it. Uh, and you don't see this web that has overtaken the city until you're already stuck in it. So my question is, because I don't get the, a lot of juice out of that reading, and the and there it's supported. There's fascist art that the set decorators put in the film, so you know it's intentional. It's not just happening to be there. Um, what is what is the city undergoing a creep towards fascism? Like in the geopolitical sense, I don't get where that pays off. Like. Is there fascism taking over the city? Is he grappling with fascism in the political sense? Do you guys get anything out of that? But Villeneuve has supported that conclusion, by the way. Okay, I thought he was saying that it was fascism only in the personal sense and that in his personality, he was trying to tightly control these women, but making everyone miserable in the process. Ah, okay. And that he himself feels like trapped in this life and that, like, he can't get out of it. He can't escape his patterns. He can't escape. For some reason, nothing makes him happy. But if it's a statement about political fascism, there's not a lot in terms of how he's, like, it's, he's living his life very freely. He's able to pursue his work or art or whatever. No one represents society, even. Yeah. I I actually, that's a, my inter- a little bit of my interpretation of the spider, and it kind of goes into the fascism aspect, which is that, Villeneuve talks a lot in a lot of his movies, like Prisoners and uh, Arrival, um, the difference between power and coercion, right? Like the concept that we all have a kind of personal power, like to somebody, a spider is powerful, right? Um, To us, to in the case of this movie, to Jake Gyllenhaal, he's the predator. Um, So it's not It's not like necessarily that like women spin their webs and are spiders and trap men. Although that's a, you know, very male centric reading of a fairly male centric. That's what an incel would think about. Right. Like, Uh, but it says nothing in the multiple portrayals of like the opening image of is kind of about their fragility. And uh, men in that case have power over women, uh, even though it's like a woman's boot hill. It's it's you know deemed worthy by men they're in a strip club it's like you keep zooming out yeah well it's a woman stepping on a spider yeah but she's in a glass case being leered at by men zoom that shit out uh and i think the key comes from like a, like power versus coercion the key comes from what professor jakes talks about in that opening kind of class or you know intermittently talks about the cycle of oppression and he doesn't realize basically to me until the last shot the famous last spider shot 
that he's a part of that cycle and he is using his power in the way that is like an evil way, a selfish, narcissistic way. And I think that that's kind of like what tyranny does is it's like we are bestowing power to you, government, but you are you took that power and became coercive. You uh, manipulated your people for your own gain. And that is the difference between power and coercion. And I think Villeneuve likes stories about that. So it doesn't seem like it wouldn't be different. That that would be his interest here is, I guess, what I'm saying. The, the key with that last right. shot is not that a spider jumps out and attacks him. I call it a jump scare. If you haven't seen the film, that's probably what you're picturing. The spider retreats into yeah. a corner and cowers from it. It's a gigantic eight-foot-wide spider, a tarantula, but at the sight of him, it kind of shrieks and whimpers and jumps back, and then it cuts back to him, and he kind of sighs in resignation, which is almost a sitcom way, like, Maud, you done it again. Like, he's just, like, tired of this shit, but kind of amused. It's so funny. Which makes sense if you're trying to see this <laughs> yeah. juxtaposition between his view that this woman who you know, was mothering his child has trapped him in this life like a spider has caught him which is this incredibly selfish and destructive point of view like it's an incredibly immature way to look at what's actually happening because she's always portrayed as being you know very nurturing and, and desperately wanting the kind version of a him neutral back. to good partner yeah, not yeah. she doesn't want anthony she wants adam the one that's actually hates himself more because he's actually decent to her that he sees her as like, oh, you know, here we go. She's, you know, I, I've got to get away from this thing that's trying to ensnare me in this the life. ball and chain. Where this, from the spider's yeah. point of view, it's like she looks and sees that Anthony is back and it's like she's physically repulsed. It's like I, I thought I had yeah. the man who I knew originally, I thought he was back. I thought Adam was back. And instead it's this narcissist, this guy who who wants to go out to these sleazy clubs and 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 to pursue this career as an actor or whatever. Um it's like, oh no, it's it's him. And she's terrified. This giant spider is terrified of him. Yeah. And of course goes to the name you would think at first, or if you're reading the initial view track of Oh, it's about a doppelganger. I wonder who's the evil one or whatever's going to happen with this, If as if it were a traditional horror. It's called Enemy in that sense. And then, of course, you realize, no, no, no. He treats women as the enemy. Abe, you want to talk about moms now? <laughs> <laughs> I love your setups, man. You always make me feel good. Um, yeah, I do. I kind of do. Because I think that that's one of the marks that people miss a lot with the spider thing. Uh, there's definitely a lot of chatter on like, you know, film Reddit and film Twitter about this that I've encountered, but more or less, there's this, com there seems to be two competing theories in mass. One is that spiders are women to Jake Gyllenhaal, uh, and that includes mothers. Um, now I think that that is a kind of like, you can kind of say that that's true. But I think that the better read is it's more of what they represent. So it's it's more of commitment being becoming the person that you need to be to become a family, uh, to be devoted to your family. The mom is a nurturing force, but she's also one that is like her lines when they 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 actually talk in person at one point. Uh, you have a nice, stable job, a professor. Stop trying to be this actor. You know, he's like, but mom, I want to be the thing I want to be. So to to him, it does represent this form of hegemony. So that's where it's like, I don't think it's that women do this naturally. It's because he has set up an enemy in his mind of women. And now he thinks that they're the regime that is, you know. He see an enemy. When he's wrong about that, he is the person who is bringing the cycle back he's the one who keeps he got the sex and card and said yeah let's go man yeah, <laughs> yeah he's the yeah. one who is not coming up on the promise of like saying what he's doing and therefore he's a liar he's you know like he is the problem and he's coercive and it's destructive right this is you have to get back to life now this is the reminder that you see when you look into the city this is your future this is how you're this is what the city is like it's it feels like webs to you, but it's not webs, dude. It's just power. Lines, and of course, man. the one that 
the photo that they share, which functions both as a clue that they are the same guy, or at least can be read that way. And the one who tries not to think about the wife that he's cheating on, his photo is torn so that she's not in it. So like, it's very elegant in the way that I find nothing is superfluous. There's not, there's almost nothing in it that doesn't mean something. And even stuff is a clue structurally. Like I would say, if you're reading it from the, I wonder what the resolution to the doppelganger is going to be point of view, the mom scene, you're like, why'd we have that scene? And it's like, cause that's a clue that you're reading it wrong and you'll have to watch this movie again, probably, you know, it's because the mom is only is in one and only one scene and she is a little controlling in it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's, and there's phone calls. That's right. The beginning and the end of the movie, there's film starts with a call from mother ends with a voicemail. Um, and the first one is like, I can't believe you're living in that shitty apartment. Uh, you know, like you got to get your life basically together uh so it's a tragedy and then at the end it's kind of like you have a nice apartment i love that you know like i love i love so it's we're kind of also trying to kind of like what jason said in that we have the cyclic nature so we don't really know where we are in time you know a, a, a sine wave is a cosine wave just in out of phase so it's like it's very funny to me that to say that this is like you could say that Anthony is the past of Adam um, and it feels that way. The movie presents it in a way that that's kind of the realization or that's how the realization hits. Oh, no, you but can I, totally read it as Adam is slowly becoming Anthony, too. It but, works either. Yeah. <laughs> but I think because we're dealing with it on the subconscious level as uh, infuriating for some viewers as that might be. Um I think that you, you kind of have to see it as just like, no, they're just one guy. By the way, Fight Club is on our list of movies to cover that a guest could pick from. And I haven't watched it intentionally all the like for, you know, more than two decades, probably because I will watch it whenever we cover it. Fascinated to know if I think it's full of shit or good still, because I loved it at the time. And I know it's famously people have soured on it, right? Or think it's trite I, now. Or... Well, I think that people ignore the last half of the movie that is dedicates itself to explaining why every single thing Tyler Durden said was wrong. They only remember the first part where he's cool, but the the fact a hero. saying Rick yeah. style, yeah, saying stuff, stuff that's about, the, on a surface yeah. level sounds true because it's not unrelated to this film, because I think a lot of people could come away from this movie saying, well, the point of view of this movie is that women are spiders and are trying to constrain this guy's life. I, I mean, I would hope people understand this is seeing everything from the point of view of the protagonist. That's how he sees his mother and the, the, and the women in his life. And so you you get scenes early where these women accuse him of cheating, but you don't realize yet that he is because you don't realize it's the same guy. So it sounds like a false accusation. Mm-hmm. And then when Mary goes and spies on him and sees him that he's working back at the school again and she confronts him later and she, he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. She's like, I think you do. I think you do. It sounds like she's crazy. It sounds like right. she's delusional. And then you eventually. Because you've only seen him acting when, like he yes. is normal. And so, quote unquote, it's yeah. only later on that you realize, oh, no, the women are the rational ones in this story. But because you you were seeing things through his skewed point of view and the way he has divided his personality to where when he says, you know, no, I'm not cheating on you. You're being ridiculous. Like in that moment, no, he was. But in that moment mm-hmm. when we're watching it, we're with him and it's like, oh my gosh, this guy's got these crazy women in his life holding him down, that he's miserable all the time. But that's his point of view. That That's not, you know, and likewise, Fight Club in the beginning was trying to pump up Tyler Durden as being the super cool dude who's seen through society. That's seeing it through his point of view. And then it's supposed to shatter that later on. But most people's memory of that film stops <laughs> before the final act. It's like, man, <laughs> they walked out like, man, Tyler Durden yeah. is so cool. He's right. <laughs> Modern cool life dude. does does yeah. keep down us dudes. Okay, fascinating. I'm excited to watch that again. I really am. Um, but yeah, the real magic offer of the movie, besides people turning into 
spiders and various parts of spiders is just the idea that two facets of your psyche could be surprised to find out the other one exists, right? Like other than that, you're just watching a thing play out that has that it does in our minds all the time. It's just literalized. And I love that speaking of skinning things different ways. So we've mentioned it several times and I do want to just say the jump scare, if you haven't seen it, stop the podcast, watch the movie. But if you don't care, the jump scare, the whole movie leads up to, it doesn't have, and this is why I think it works. It doesn't have the music that you associate with a jump scare. It doesn't have a loud sound besides the whimper that Jason mentioned. And it, like you said, it's not a thing coming at you. It's actually a thing going, oh shit, sorry, please don't be mad at me. And that is chilling Both in the immediate, because if you're not thinking about these things, and I wasn't the first watch, the first watch, I just went, whoa, what the fuck was fuck's that supposed to mean? Jeez, scary. But what the fuck's that supposed to mean? Right. And then it takes a couple watches. That's the kind of movie I I honestly really love. Um, But I love that it can be read so many ways with the one we haven't mentioned yet that really stood out to me on this viewing is. And I talk about this with Jen all the time because they're deathly afraid of spiders. But you're a thousand times the size and force of a spider. And foregoing like a brown recluse biting you in your sleep, a spider's way more scared of you than you are of it. So it's a symbol of a thing. And we use it all the time as symbols in all kinds of movies, comics, video games. But we always use it as the symbol of something that has a power like we're a fly. But we're not a fly. We're fucking human being. And compared to a human being, a spider ain't shit you can crush it with a high heel so that's it's like you so rarely see spider symbols with that added dimension used. right that's why in a lot of our media if there's a scary spider it's enormous or it's a or like you're tiny spider, or whatever. like yeah. a radioactive one that bites peter parker because we don't care about us like a spider can't really do or this damage that a spider could actually do, and some of it can be destructive, you know, like Black Widows and whatnot. Uh, it's mundane. So I think that's part of Villeneuve's genius is he, it's funny because he makes crazy offers, right? Like he's attracted to things like Dune where it's a giant spaceship that's a huge orb and people in weird costumes, but he presents them mundane. He's really unassuming and it works well across the board. But like, I think it makes that jump scare so much scarier than it would have been if you tried to milk it. And in the same way, I think this might be the only movie that I can think of where an actor plays his own doppelganger and he doesn't make a big deal of it or even try to make them act that different or may be like, look how hard I'm acting. Look at these characters I developed. Uh, Like Gyllenhaal was clearly in on the assignment and understood what they were doing and was trying to accomplish what they were doing, not trying to act really good. Does that make sense? And I really appreciate that. They were a really good fit uh, because they kind of have the same like subtlety approach. It's, you know, some people may not be as subtle, but like they definitely want you to be watching for the small ticks or the small maneuvers and be like, I'll do them a lot and you'll just notice over time. Uh, And some people don't like that aspect, but I, you know, they definitely see eye to eye in that regard. Yeah. And don't, there's not like a ton of shots that are like, look how they're doubled, you know, which I still see and stuff where they're like, look at our green screen. Yeah. Yeah, We don't see mirror shit. Yeah. And there's at least one scene here where it's not clear which one, which one we're looking at. Where whether we're watching Anthony because it's like they are wearing an outfit that isn't distinctly one or the other. There's at least one shot. I don't specifically remember which one it is where they're close in on him, but it's not clear which one we're looking at at that moment. I don't I can't pick it out, but that makes sense. I believe you. it makes sense. He would, <laughs> put, he would put that in there because there would be he wants to give you one signal to be like, yeah, you can't even tell, can you? You know, like. Yeah. That's the whole point, because I think a lot of a lot of uh, the criticism lob that I've seen also is just that, like, they didn't do enough to make me understand who was who. And I was very confused. And it's like, yeah, Primer gets that same kind of, you know, like criticism as well. It's kind of the point. That's the game of the movie. This movie is choosing to be confusing. It's a puzzle movie. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. In, in the case of Primer, that is literally the puzzle because it's a puzzle movie. But in this movie, it's more of like, yeah, I want you to like get rid of that. Throw that out. 
it's about the subconscious, or at least that's what I believe. It's about the statements I'm making, not did the math work out? Are the guys chilling hole? <laughs> yeah. I actually remember and oh, go I ahead. remember which scene it was. It's when he goes to visit his mother and he's asking her, like it's clear Oh, that makes perfect he sense. He has gone to ask her if she if he has a twin and she's like, No, I only yeah. have and then she's like, Do you want some blueberries? He's like, I don't like blueberries. But we specifically heard the actor earlier, like he's on a big blueberry kick. Say he does. And yeah. then after he says he doesn't like blueberries, she says, and why don't you just give up, you know, this thing with being a third rate actor? So it's like, well, now, hold on. Am I watching? I thought this was, <laughs> I thought this was the teacher. Is, is it? And she's so. You'd confirmed it's Adam. And now you're but, taking it back. But the way he's yeah. sitting there at the table, Brilliant. like he's doing that thing, like typically Adam is kind of hunched over and, and you know, and then Anthony is like kind of upright and more cocky and laid back. And the way he's sitting, it kind of looks like Adam and you assume that's him, but he's also in a state of, you know, like anguish or whatever. And that was Upset. the first yeah. time it, the film really tries to say, yeah, it kind of, it kind of doesn't matter. And I guess you could say that it's, and I, I think it is that a certain type of bad person, they do compartmentalize their personalities. And I don't mean in a multiple personality sense. I mean that they're the guy who will wake up the next day and apologize to what to their wife for what they said or what they did but they they'll say it in the in the terms of well i wasn't myself last night or i you know how i get when i'm like that i mean but like yeah. they will totally where my partner and i are watching vanderpump rules you know recently uh, or they'll just say I was super drunk, bro. Like, and, and it's funny because groups of people who are all alcoholic will go, well, that's a, that's valid because I'm going to do that to you later. So we, in this group, I'll accept that that's okay. You were just drunk. Okay. Uh, then it's, I guess it's just business is another one, right? It's just business. Yeah. It, okay. So you can do anything if it's business. Okay. And it's like, you've <laughs> just roped off that part of yourself. And it's to the point where if she accused him of cheating and he says, no, don't be ridiculous. Like in his mind, be like, well, when I'm in my lonely moods and when I'm, you know, that's, and, and I'm forced to go out and, and have sex with this other woman, like, that's not me. That's, you know, that's, that's something that you, you, that's a state of mind that you force me into sometimes. Like he would literally, that's how he forgives himself for what he does and doesn't confront it. And I think there are people who operate like that all the time. And I think this is this kind of the narcissist that Anthony is. I think that's specifically the kind of person he's supposed to be. In addition uh, to that psychology, like there's something you said earlier, Michael, that was like having that realization or having that moment where it's almost funny that he's like, oh, I t turn around and, and I, I realized I was one guy kind of thing. <laughs> it's laughable in some way, but I think that subconsciously that's that's how kind of realization uh, of self happens. Like a lot of alcoholics have referred to it as like a moment of clarity, you know, like this concept of when you can kind of see outside yourself and you see what the situation is and you're able to pass judgment and not try to defend it or, you know, just have this new tier perspective. Um, I think psychologically, this movie is really about reaching that point and you're kind of rooting for him in that regard of like destroy your demons a little bit, but the, it has the psychological trick to me where it also ends in a really dark way where it says the cycle m must continue. Uh, you are just your, your victim to your, uh, genetics circumstance, your brain, your addictions. And so I wonder, what do you guys think the movie is saying about getting out? Uh, I, the car crash literally has that line where it just yells that over and over and over. Uh, and I think that that's, what does he say? Get out, get out, get out, get out. Yeah. Like it just screams it out, over uh, and over. And I think that that's, you know, probably, uh, chosen words for that specific. Kind well, in of that moment, moment, if I if I recall, he they do a similar trick as Jason just pointed out in the mother scene, where he yells at her for something that is true of Helen, not her, who is Mary. <laughs> so they're just like interchangeable, and like you say, when he gets that sex key invite, eyes wide shut card, it's like so you just even though you just killed that guy. 
when you step out the door of your apartment building, he's alive again. <laughs> like you just brought him. Now there's two of you again, because you split, you split him off. You split him off as many times as are necessary. Right. And I love that he's driving. So like he kills the mistress, whatever that symbolizes, literal or figurative, um, in a car accident. I think it's specifically a car accident because he's in the driver's seat. He kills both of them and there's nothing she can do. She has no control. He has all the control of whether, fine, fuck it. No, fuck it then. We'll just kill ourselves. And it's like, wait, I didn't, can I get out of the car when it's driving a safe right. speed? So, no. <laughs> you know. What do you think the movie's saying about getting out of your oh, you know, cycle of depression? I don't think it's, That's... I think it ends in the middle of a guy who's still working on it. I don't think it tells us the roadmap out. I'm it's not really to... about healing. We don't see him leave and go to the weird spider strip club. We just see him stand at the doorway and confront his pregnant wife, and he sighs with resignation. That could be him making the decision not to go. Maybe seeing her. Yeah, being, maybe there's a divorce incoming. Maybe there's a picture about to be torn in half. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, think that's, I think that's the part of the point to us, part of the ambiguity, is that, like it kind of doesn't matter. You are seeing a snapshot of somebody in the middle of – their cycle what a cyclical whether, thing it's yeah. kind of like all time in a way it's wow slaughterhouse fight it's even better than i thought you can read the end as maybe this was the last cycle but maybe it isn't i also just realized you could literally cut from the end of the movie to the first shot of the movie and it would make yeah. diegetic sense you could watch the movie in cycles easily i thought that too i yeah. was like llewellyn davis is in the in just the building. hiding yeah. in the in the in the building going just like yeah just, that's right and well and then the scenes would read slightly differently like if you just immediately hit play on the movie again it would be like now adam's at the sex club i wonder what he's thinking and it would be slightly different than what you thought the first time through but still the more cycles you did the more samey it would be and the more it would just become a cycle you know because the first I the first it. shot of the film is his wife like his naked wife sitting on the bed the pregnant one sitting on the bed looking kind of distressed and then you see him sitting in his car looking also distressed but it's not clear which guy you're looking at when that is um so yeah that could easily be the next morning you know that night whatever but but and of course that's i think that's the the point but it doesn't have to be the message doesn't have to be it's hopeless. It's just here's a portrait of a guy stuck in right. a cycle that he has something about himself that he can't move past an immaturity, a selfishness of whatever. Yeah, yeah, I don't feel like it's saying that means you can't or no one can. I don't get that vibe, but that's just a but vibe But if it thing. is a cycle, we just yeah. continue and continue and he never really does. Yeah, and so does humanity, but, you and know, that's writ large, like, each cycle changes slightly, 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 and that's how you get evolution, right? That's how right. a million cycles later, it is kind of different, but it mm -hmm. took a million cycles. You just got to keep going ahead. Yeah, true. Now, another way that, too, too true. that this film kind of rewards you on multiple viewings, which, by the way, it, it, to anyone looking to make, make films out there, making a, a movie that only truly makes sense on second viewing not a good business model. Terrible he, career he, well, move. Not, yeah. But works for him though. He, yeah, that's true. He but, but typically that is it is difficult to get people to watch your thing once. So here, like when you get the final shot with the spider and realize that he is associating spiders with not just femininity, but mothers, his mother, the mother of his soon-to-be child. Then when you see that his <laughs> Your first thought is, I gotta watch this shit again. Yeah, now. because then when you see the weird sex show he's going to, it's like, why is this guy cranking his hog to the side of a woman crushing a spider? And it's like, oh no, that's oh, that's now it's obvious. That's perfect yeah. because someone who is a misogynist <laughs> who simultaneously loves the female form and wants to get off on it, but also wants to see it destroyed. And wants to see like this. He's watching a sex show where this representation of his wife and his mother is being crushed under a high heel. And like, that's what he gets off on. Like the hate of women that lies at the heart of men who are super horny and that that clash of like, I've not seen many films that have represented it as well as this because 
when he is in that club and he's watching this happen, he is not. It's not a strip club thing where they're all, all like getting drunk and goofing off and stuffing dollar bills into the the spider's tiny. No, it's very serious it's, art. It's all business. It like, they're right? staring yeah. at it. Anything for business. Yeah, they're they're all silent and staring at it. And it's like, and when he meets the guy, the the fellow perv later, the guy's like, "I need to do it again." Like I've not gotten an invite. Mm-hmm. Invite. They've cut me off, but I it did something for me. And it's like the thing that's doing for them is seeing some form of womanhood destroyed and that's what they get off on it's like such an ugly part right. of himself that he has to go do in secret but that there's plenty of other men who also kind of want to do it uh that's that's great it's dark it doesn't it doesn't beat you over the head with it it's a thing there were the first time you see it that you think it's just imagery that has been picked because it's striking and weird but no, it's all cohesive. It's all cohesive theme, and at the center of this guy's being is something very ugly that he he has to get past. Gosh, I love that if you if you do hit play on it a second time immediately after the first time, something that was very cryptic is immediately very easy to decode. Like I don't know, that's such a reward for a second watch to immediately understand the initial image way better than you did the first time. Bravo, Phil New. <laughs> it's good. It's good. And book. And whoever wrote the book. It's a, and it seems book. good. Let's all hear it. For also, book. book. Can we get for the folks in the booth and book? Can we? <laughs> can, no, I love book, that Jason's no, on okay. to promote his book and we're joking about how it's a dead ma- dead form. <laughs> Don't say it in, in front the bathroom. of the guest. <laughs> um, while I'm scraping the bottom of my notes, I will ask do other people have thoughts that are worth taking up the audience's time with on enemy oh i wanted to ask you michael it's kind of like shatter day yeah the harlan ellison right two and, versions yeah. of yourself at war one version prepared to do the commitment thing the other's a fuck boy yeah if y'all um, are patrons and interested at all uh, I do a show about the short fiction of Harlan Ellison. There's two stories it really reminds me of that we've covered. Shatterday, Abe was the guest. And the other one for which Adam, the third of the biggest beans triumvirate, uh, was the guest for, I'm just fishing for the title, Chain, for the Fast, Chain to the Fast Lane in the Red Queen's Race, which is about a cycle of addiction where at the end of the cycle, an extra version is made. And so they keep stacking up and stacking up until there's way too many of them. And the entire world is, you know, they live in their addiction. Uh, Both reminded me of Enemy. And I don't know what that means. But yes, I agree. (laughs) I thought of those things. Mm -hmm. You got anything else? There's one aspect of this film and the plot and the way it's set up that I think above all else contributes to why people are confused by it. I think the symbolism and the structure would be much, much clearer without this very simple switch that I assume came from the book, but it's not totally clear, clear reading the book summary. If you have two personalities and the whole premise is you have one guy living in a kind of a mundane life that he feels constrained, you would think the setup would be works at a school, has a pregnant wife in a crappy in a crappy apartment, and then the immature version of himself dreams of being a playboy actor. Nice place, right. working as an actor. The, but uh, the actor works as an extra, banging, barely. Banging, uh, essentially. Well, that's the thing, and and then and then banging some hot Shows lady on the failing. side. But they flipped it, where it's like the reality he's trying to get back to. It's like the actor has the pregnant wife. That's the baseline. So is it? That's where it gets because there. If they had set it up the opposite way, it'd be very clear. It's like, oh, this is he's got this immature fantasy, and so he has rented this mm-hmm. little you know apartment or he's rented this apartment or whatever or he's found a woman who is paying for the apartment or whatever and he's doing that on site but he needs to retreat back to his actual responsible life a teacher with a pregnant wife and it's the opposite it's the teacher right. persona that has the girlfriend who he in the first opening parts of the movie actually physically assaults and she storms out but i guess the teacher version who did that and then the actor one who has a very nice apartment and the pregnant wife that he's the married one. You would think it would be the opposite. If he if you agree with the read that he's like both men and it's like one psyche that we're dealing with, uh, like the flip is a red herring to make you th- be more compassionate towards Professor Jake and think of the actor Jake as a stereotype. 
And then the idea of like the familial situation or the relationship situation being reversed from those expectations is exactly what he wants. You could look at it that way, or you could also even, I think, save it, quote unquote, by saying that it's a gesture towards the fact that once you do enough cycles, the parts are interchangeable. Uh, that is help helps define what a cycle is. Is Anthony is Adam, so therefore we switch some of the pieces because that's the point. They're the same. Uh, yeah. And I don't know if I that's intentional. That. Um, I feel like we've reached the fringes of what we can prove. Uh, but yeah, I do think it's an interesting swap. And it must there must be some reason, but I can't say with confidence, like, that's definitely what they meant, you know? Yeah. So why is- I also think if if your friend had a doppelganger in a movie, even a small part like a bellhop, wouldn't you notice? I'd be like, Abe, you got to see this movie, dude. You're in I was it, more bro. offended by the shot choice of the director of the movie to include an extra that prominently. Is it looked, yeah, it looked like some Dunstan checks in too straight to DVD like, shit. He's that guy in the background. I also love that in his fantasy, he's like a low level featured extra sometimes in a few movies. <laughs> well, but I think that's... I think that's part of it is that he has tried to pursue this fantasy as an actor and that's all he's getting. So that kind of hints at why he's so dissatisfied because he may have because you see the way he dresses like he's very fit. He's very handsome. He's you know, he clearly sees himself as like a movie star type. And then you see the actual part. And he performs at school. He gets off on lecturing in a very performative way. Yeah, And so then you see the parts he's getting. So that adds to why, again, the, the first part part of this film, very works very hard to set up this is somebody who is deeply dissatisfied with the way things are going. So once you later realize, oh, this is a guy trying to balance two careers and the one that he really wants isn't going anywhere. And so that's why that's part of why he, you know, he probably blames his pregnant wife for why he can't move to LA and get the big acting jobs or whatever. Um, you know, it's just e- very easy to project that once you know what's going on. It's just that I can see why once you hear, you know, the star and the filmmaker explain, oh, yeah, it's just about a guy who's, you know, trying to – he's having an affair and he's got to get it's back to his normal life. It's almost a tricky answer. Yeah. It's, yeah. But uh, otherwise, I think a lot of the people who listen to this and hear our recommendation to go see this movie will go see it and they will not enjoy it because it is a film that – I'm not saying it's, it's a film that's <laughs> pretty dreary. It's not designed to be enjoyed. It's a film that is meant to be watched more than once. It's a film that is meant to reward thinking about it. But please, please, please appreciate that it is a film that has extreme care put into every single choice from in every mm-hmm. shot in every edit and everything about the sound design. Like it is someone who cared deeply about the story and about the probably the source material and about the themes. You don't see that many movies like that. Even if you don't didn't enjoy the overall experience, if it's too slow, if there's too many shots of Jake Gyllenhaal just pondering in silence and being miserable in Toronto, uh, at least appreciate you have something that is lovingly crafted with layers of meaning. There is not a lot of that out there. Till we drop Papa Bear. <laughs> we, yeah. Our audience is a bunch of nerds. Nerds! Speaking of nerds, who can we thank for this enemy discussion besides Jason K. Pargin, author of Zoe's Too Drunk for This Dystopia? Abe, did that question track? Did I put in enough intervening clauses? Yeah, you put it in the right <laughs> way, and I, I picked it up immediately, and I totally knew what you meant. Uh, the answer is no one. This one is... Shit! Fuck. All Jason, baby. Oh, okay. I thought... We had someone who bundled this with another one, a documentary. I'm thinking of the wrong things then. All right. Oh, that was Napoleon Dynamite. Okay, we better get out Dynamite. of here. Dynamite. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, great. Then we have we have a big gaping hole where I was going to do a plug and I can't. So, Jason, would you mind filling that vacancy with some information about your book again? Yeah. Zoe is too drunk for this dystopia, available in all formats. If you're hearing this before the 31st, it's, you might as well just order it. That's, it's going to arrive in the same amount of time if it was, if it was actually out, um, but available on audio. If you want to catch up with me outside of that, I am Jason K. Pargent on TikTok, where I somehow have 330,000 followers as of the time of this recording. The same number Jesus had when he died. But uh, I'm that same username also <laughs> on Twitter slash X and on threads and blue sky and instagram and youtube and facebook 
and uh, probably elsewhere. I can't do it, man. Just hearing you say that made me tired. We're just doing TikTok now. By the way, Small Beans Comedy on TikTok, it's a new thing we're trying. But to do Blue Sky 2 and Threads, uh, it's killing me. But good for you. Good for you. So to do a pun I did before under the shuffle, go see an enemy. Uh, The end. uh, uh. (laughs) 